So before I start, I should say this, this uh, presentation is filled with what I believe to be are facts, uh, which of course means they're data that have been processed by my own prejudices. And so if you find what I present as a fact to not be a fact, or if you have a different idea, just tell me. I'd like to learn from everybody. Um, so again, before we start, a, a lot of this material is based on two PhD theses by Mike Koss and Lisa Winter and uh, part of Marcio Melendez's PhD thesis. So there's been an awful lot of data analysis and interpretation here. Uh, Mike is um, about to join Kevin and uh, ETH in, in Switzerland. And uh, Marcio is now at, at the University of Maryland. And Lisa was a uh, Einstein fellow who is now off doing work in the real world. Yeah, she's... Uh, she went to work for a company that does space physics research. She says it pays real money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me get started. So I'm going to pre um, so uh, presenting results from the Swift Bat Hard X-ray Survey. This is the Hard X-ray Band 15 to 200 keV band. Why do you want to survey this guy in that crazy wavelength band for people studying black holes, it's because the photons basically go through um, column densities uh, that are tau Compton of about one. In other words, you can see things with uh, that are almost Compton thick. And um, before the bat, there had not been any such survey uh, that was sensitive enough. It's still working, and so we're getting more and more sensitive with time. I'll show you some technical details about how that works. Uh, we have followed up a lot of the sources with uh, other data in X-ray, classical optical bands using optical telescopes, but also in the IR with Spitzer and Herschel. I'll show you a tiny taste of the Herschel data. And we've just been getting EVLA observations. It turns out that um, classical radio data, you think they've been doing wonderful things for many years now, but a lot of these objects are not well-observed radio. Now I'm going to claim this is, of course, a biased statement, the first unbiased survey of AGN. <laughs> And what does it mean to be uh, unbiased? So we select AGN. We don't, by their hard X-ray emission, we don't care about their soft X-ray emission, their ultraviolet, their radio, their optical, whatever. So the objects are selected with complete, un no knowledge at all of the host galaxy. So there's no biases at all with that respect. And um, they're also relatively unbiased with respect to obscuration in the sense that we can see things with tau Compton of roughly one. And so even if there is obscuration close to the AGN or in the host galaxy, we still detect them. What? Except for the fraction that are thicker than... than well, tau, so above tau of two, things get really bad, and above tau of three, they're invisible. Yeah, there might be. So, um, of course, why does one want to do x-rays from a first-order principle? Because we actually now know, thanks to gravitational lensing, that the x-rays are occurring within about 10 or 30 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. And so they are an excellent instantaneous estimator of what's going on, as opposed to other wavelength bands like the IR or the optical, which are secondary. The signals you see depend on the convolution of the AGN emission with the GIST distribution of dust and gas. And therefore, there's an extra level of confusion involved. Uh, so that's what I mean. <coughs> Direct evidence, the stuff comes within 100 Schwarzschild radii. And like I said, of all the available radiation, they're the most penetrating, um, with the possible exception of high-frequency radio. Can I interrupt with a genuine question? Sure. Which is, now that New Star has begun operation, how does the bat plus sensitivity compare to New Star? Okay. Per unit time, New Star is more than 100 times more sensitive, and New Star has much better angular resolution. So for going fainter, New Star is vastly superior. On the other hand, the New Star field of view is very, very small. It's a few square, well, it's about 100 square arc minutes, and so they don't, cannot survey the, the whole sky. So um, if you look at specific classes of objects uh, that are revealed by going fainter, the new star wins. If you win by going to larger solid angle, that wins. Um, so we have these very modest goals uh, to redo the last 50 years of AGN research with a, a much less biased sample. And I hope to convince you that at least we're part of the way towards that goal. You know, all the usual things one wants to know, the relationship of all the different bands to each other, how much total luminosity is there really, because almost all their surveys are very biased in that regard. Of course, the Eddington ratio. I'm going to talk today mostly about, the almost totally about the relation of the host galaxy, the AGN, 
and a tiny bit about triggering mechanisms for AGN. So most of the talk is going to be relation to the host galaxy. And of course, we want to understand this relationship you know, for feedback. Uh, it's not clear that these objects are experiencing feedback, but everything is really close by. The median redshift is 0.03, and so we can literally see everything that's going on in great detail with very high angular and physical resolution. So um, if something is going on, basically this is a sample in which one can see it. Uh, there are tremendous problems with doing this in the high redshift universe. Okay, just to remind you, uh, thanks to Chandra and XMM, uh, in the 2 to 10 keV lower energy band, uh, what these missions have shown is that what we thought before they were launched, the number of AGN, how they evolve, the nature of the host, the total energy, the correlation function, were all incorrectly estimated by optical and radio surveys. Um, to, to zeroth order, the integrated bolometric luminosity of hard X-ray selected AGN is about four times that of an optically selected sample in the same chunk of the sky when you use the same selection criteria. Now that you know what the AGN are, you can go back and find very subtle, particularly IR features. But a lot of these things are AGN. Are literally, I'll show you ad nauseum some selected objects which are optically invisible completely. And um, so you really have to uh, realize if you go back before 2005, the universe has changed a lot in that regard. However, the problem with these samples is that they're basically dominated by Redshift 1 objects, roughly. And so they're very difficult to study. You basically need Hubble or very large telescopes. And even then, as I'll show in a slide later on, there are really strong selection biases in trying to understand what these objects are, even with fairly deep Hubble observations. Basically, it's surface, one plus z to the fourth, surface brightness diminution, which just kills you. Hubble's a small telescope. Okay. So the idea is that you need a very large sample at low redshifts, and that's what this has given us. So um, the method, uh, this paper was uh, appeared in AstroPH a couple months ago and is now on paper, or paper still exists in the AFJ supplement. Uh, we've issued many catalogs. This is the fifth. Every time we get roughly a factor of square root of two more sensitivity, we come out with a new catalog. Uh, this particular one, to read, we're up to 1,171 hard x-ray sources. Um, so the sample is actually getting rather large. Um, but what I'm going to show you today is based on a prior catalog uh, and basically biased to the northern hemisphere for the telescope kind we could get and where the Sloan have their data. So the sample size I'm going to be talking about for most of this talk is only about 150 or 200 objects. There are many more, but we haven't gotten to them yet. And like I said, we've gotten lots of other data. Uh, we've had 340 Herschel objects, uh, five photometric bands. We have a few hundred Spitzer spectra. So we've been busy. Okay, and of course the um, motivation is, you know, what's feedback? I think this is our present understanding of feedback. Uh, <laughs> you don't disagree, or you disagree? <laughs> okay. Um, and we all know at this workshop that you need something in addition to uh, gravity in order to make things work in, in great detail. The question is, what is it? And you can, if you look through the theoretical papers, basically they are very careful not to tell us the physical mechanisms responsible for feedback. They do things like inject momentum, they inject energy, they inject particles, but the detailed physics is not fully understood. So basically we have to observe it. Uh, unfortunately, nature makes it hard to observe at the epochs where feedback may be dominant, but at least we can now observe complete samples, well understood samples in the lower redshift universe and look directly for samples of feedback. I'm not going to show you direct samples of feedback in this talk, um, but I will show you the what beautiful Chandra data where we do see direct samples of feedback. This is the Perseus cluster. This is Cygnus A. Uh, this is the X-ray emission, and these giant bubbles or giant wisps are the direct injection of energy from the AGN into the intergalactic medium on scales of uh, hundreds of kiloparsecs. So uh, feedback we know exists at least in clusters of galaxies. OK, so how do you find AGN? Um, almost everyone in this room has uh, either attempted to do so or has, or has uh, read about it. There's, of course, the classical optical signatures going way back to uh, Sandage and uh, others back in the uh, 70s. That's colors. So you look for things with weird colors. And the Sloan has done a spectacular job of that finds many, many, many objects based on their colors. 
Turns out, of course, that's tremendously biased. If there's a little bit of dust in the line of sight, the colors get distorted. They lie off the track. And so while this finds a huge number of objects, it's actually quite incomplete. Then there's the classical emission line strengths. We all know about that, whether they're broad or narrow, and whether they're high ionization and low ionization. I'm not going to go into details. But uh, again, this technique suffers a lot of problems, especially at low luminosity AGN, where you have dilution of the spectra from optical continuum. Dust, again, is a major factor. Things like inclination of the host galaxy strongly affect this. Another new tech, well, it's not new. It's ancient, going back, again, to the 70s, which is variability of the AGN. But uh, until the advent of things like pan stars, this has not been uh, well utilized. This turns out to be actually quite, quite nice, but you have to be able to see the nucleus in order to see whether it's variable. You can't see the nucleus in the optical and see for twos. So all of these have serious selection issues. Um, in the IR, there's been a lot of work trying to find AGN based on the IR color. And I'll show you um, where this works and where this doesn't work. The bottom line, it doesn't work in low luminosity AGN. It doesn't work in objects in which the host galaxy is a lot of extinction. Again, finds huge numbers of objects, but can't construct a complete sample or an unbiased sample. The less biased techniques are radio, which is not affected by extinction, has a very high dynamic range, very good angular resolution, but nature is unkind. Only roughly 10% of all AGN show classical um, radio features, and now I'm going to show you some of our very new data. This is a well-known AGN, 2 mass X, J20, you know, et cetera, they, you know, Fred. Uh, <laughs> and these are our Herschel results. Uh, we have Herschel 70, 160, 250, 350, and 500 micron data. They're imaging, so we can actually locate where the IR is. They're all low redshift, so we have reasonable physical resolution of about a half a kiloparsec on average. This is our recent VLA data. And this is a theoretical line from uh, the contributions of Bremsstrahlen and synchrotron due to star formation. If the IR were star formation, this is where the radio would lie. And uh, oops, hmm, maybe something's not quite right. I uh, can show you lots more of these. <laughs> uh, there is no AGN signature in the radio for this particular object. So then we're uh, stuck with the X-ray. I just argue that the X-ray has some intrinsic uh, advantages. It does have one major disadvantage, and that is that for objects of uh, less than 10 to the 42 ergs per second, there are these nasty things called ultraluminous X-ray sources, uh, which can live near but not at the nucleus by definition. And so when you're below this luminosity, identifying low luminosity AGN at moderate redshifts becomes difficult. But in the low redshift universe, it's not a big problem. Okay, so. Why do I claim that other techniques are uh, not so wonderful? This is taken from a paper by Goulding et al. the other year. This is for a chunk of the sky that's been surveyed by XMM, moderately deeply, but not enormously deeply. This is the famous, um, as we say at Maryland, Osterbrockville U diagram. Uh, no, a little after. <laughs> uh, it actually was done by Osterbrockville U, but also Baldwin, Turlovich, and Phillips. This is N2 to H alpha and O3 to H beta. AGN are supposed to live up over here. What you see uh, distributed here are in red and blue are X-ray selected AGN in this diagram. And you can just count up the number of objects here versus the number of objects there. And they're roughly equal. So roughly half of all the X-ray selected AGN would not be called AGN by optical selection criteria in this particular work. Sorry? Okay, so, okay, so um, this is work that Amy Barger, Len Cowie, and I have done in our 2005 paper. Um, every single X-ray selected AG, uh, every single optically selected AGN selected by the line ratios was detected in the X-ray in our moderately deep Chandra field. Um, in the IR, that's not true. So this is the IR selection criteria. Um, that was developed by Stern et al., where basically uh, this is the range within which um, IR, AGN are chosen from different IR colors. And again, these are two different uh, X-ray selected samples. And again, roughly half of all the X-ray detected objects lie in the IR selection, but um, half of them lie outside. The reason is that if you just plot the flux, the 24 micron flux 
versus the X-ray flux, there's about a factor of 100 variance, a full range, I'm sorry, not variance. So um, you, are set, you have strong selection effects if in a given field you don't go deep enough in either band. Yeah. The black regions in the right-hand panel are um, there in the infrared but not seen in X-ray? Um, so the red, the blue, and the black are AGN of different types, which I wasn't going to go into. The, when you're between the green boundaries, this is the Stern et al. selection criteria for finding AGN in the IR. If you go down over here, you get tremendous contamination from normal objects, T dwarfs, galaxies. And so there may be AGN down here in the IR, but the noise is so enormous you can't be guaranteed you're going to find them. But the next question is, are there infrared-selected things that don't show up in the X-ray? Yes. And, and, and I was guessing whether they were the black things. Oh, the over here. No, I don't think so. X-ray selected in color. But um, here um, you can see X-ray versus 24 microns. And there are objects that are relatively bright in 24 microns compared to their X-ray flux. So if you don't go faint enough in the X-ray, you just won't get them. Um, I suspect but don't know for sure that there may be IR-selected objects which you never detect. I've seen papers where they do stacking observations where that's true. However, at redshifts greater than about one and a half, the IR color selection has tremendous biases. And so it's not at all clear to anybody if these are really AGN or not. I think the jury is, is out on that. You're about to say something, Mike? Go back one slide, uh, two slides. I'm going to so get... I, I'm not sure I got the point. Okay. This. So this is a, a chunk of the sky which has both Sloan data and XMM data. Um, Goulding and Truet in a separate paper have done the same thing. They found AGN by their X-ray properties. And then they've gone look at the optical spectra for these objects. So all of these have optical spectra. The ones that are red are, are Compton Fig candidates. And the ones that are blue are quote unquote normal AGN. This is the uh, Culey et al. Um, dividing line. These are isopleths of the X-ray selected AGN. In other words, this is just an uh, isopleths of the color density. The objects that are, color, are blue here are X-ray selected AGN. All of these objects down here are X-ray selected AGN that do not have the Culey at all uh, line ratios. What does it mean to be an X-ray selected AGN? X-ray selected AGN is a point-like source in the nucleus of the object with a luminosity greater than 10 to the 42 ergs per second. So by definition, your X-ray selected AGNs are effectively mostly just X-ray sources. Point like X-ray sources. Point like X-ray sources in the nucleus. Well, and uh, as far as we know, this boundary of 10 to the, I'll show you what 10 to the 42 means in a moment, but there are no uh, non-supermassive black holes that have that luminosity. You can do it the math in your head. That's the Eddington ratio of 10 to the fourth for a solar mass black hole. And if you like to have 10 to the fourth solar mass black holes, I'm with you. But a lot of people don't. <laughs> <laughs> the contours, hold on, the contours on that plot, what are they again, are they? So, they are point-like X-ray sources in the nucleus of a galaxy. The contours? No, no, no. The contours are, um, these are uh, the iso, the, the density of star-forming, sorry, star-forming galaxies. So this is where star-forming galaxies live in the Cooley plot, and there are a few that are up over here, but the, I'm trying to ignore the contours. This is not my figure. The uh, blue points is what I'd like you to focus on, which are the X-ray selected AGN. So, okay. So to understand what what the point is here, let me see if I understand what the point is. Uh, the objects. C count the number of objects down here yeah, versus say, up there. Let sure. Me say, the objects uh, that fall right on top of the star forming. Mm -hmm. locus, right. The blue objects. Those are objects where the AGN dominates the X-ray emission, but there must be a lot of star formation around the nucleus. That it's either the line ratios. Well, there's two possibilities. I'll show you both examples of both <coughs> later in a moment. One is that exactly what you just said. There's a lot of star formation, so the AGN signature is diluted. Or there's a class of objects which have the great acronym XBONGs, which show no optical indicators of either star formation or AGN. -ness. Well, then they wouldn't have, they wouldn't land in that part. No, they wouldn't land in that, that part. Yeah. There is morphological cast. I'm thinking XMM is, doesn't have mm. a superb spatial resolution. Right. So, some of these X-ray emissions actually due to 
Gas, you know, massively. Sure, that's, that's why. That's as luminous as. Yeah, so if you pick 10 to the 42, um, there's two criteria. In addition, suppose your image is fuzzy and you can't say it's in the nucleus. Um, you can look at the X-ray spectra. I don't know from this paper if they did so or not. But at, again, above 10 to the 42, the hot gas contribution from ellipticals is pretty small. There are no isolated galaxies that have hot gas emission that more luminous than that. It'll also be softer. That's right. That's the spectrum. Yeah. So if they had X-ray spectral indicators, they could have used that. But if you're just really gross and just want to use luminosity indicators, and you use 10 to the 42 in the low redshift universe, you're pretty safe. In the high redshift universe, it's not clear. So I think they're, they're on safe grounds. So um, then you can ask yourself, what are the properties of AGN selected by different techniques? This is from a paper by Ryan Hickox a few years ago where he did both optical, X, sorry, radio, x-ray, and IR selection. And what you see here are different colors. So this is the number of objects versus the um, bolometric luminosity. And the uh, radio selected objects, as you're finding in your sample, tend to be uh, low bolometric luminosity. The, and then the IR tend to be high bolometric luminosity. Again, it's a distinction effect. They have to be bright enough to outshine the host galaxy. This is now the mass of the black hole. And you can see that the radio tend to be massive black holes. And the IR tend to be lower mass black holes. And the X-ray are all over the place. And the bottom plot is the Eddington ratio, where there's this extreme distinction. The radio high mass, low luminosity puts them at very low Eddington ratios. The, radi the IR, which is the reverse, at high Eddington ratios, and the X-ray lie over a very wide range in Eddington, but in the sample, in this particular sample, don't go to low Eddington ratios because of the sensitivity effects. So there is a difference in how you select them, and using these three techniques, the X-ray covers the widest range of intrinsic properties. But <coughs> not in this work, but in the work you're talking about, the green plot in particular on the bottom, <coughs> the X-ray green histogram would extend all the way. Uh, no, it turns out that we have a similar, just by accident. Okay. I if you, you said that you found no, well, we have found objects. Um, hold on. Uh, de, da, skip over all these plots. Go, whoops, go here. Show somebody else's work, you know. <laughs> so, um, Berlon et al., working with Marco Aiello, have used the same data, but independent analysis. It's always nice to show somebody else's stuff. And this is their sample. This is, again, the All Sky sample. This is a 10 to the 44, so this is 10 to the 42. And you can see that fortuitously, <laughs> we don't have to worry about those low luminosity interlopers because we're not sensitive enough. Okay. So this is the luminosity function. Uh, so this is L squared times the normal luminosity function. This is energy, if you will, being emitted. This shows you two separate things where most of the luminosity comes out. It comes out at about 10 to the 43 ergs a second. And it shows you where the characteristic luminosity is in the luminosity function, which, of course, is the similar number. So we are sampling the bulk in the low redshift universe of the emissivity. Uh, we have a bias against very low luminosity objects. And there are subtle differences between AGN that are absorbed and unabsor unabsorbed. I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. That's another whole talk. But the point is that because we're relatively unbiased against absorption, you can make statements like that. So what do I mean by um, no optical indicators? Now oh, let's take this one. It's an NGC galaxy. It's really close by. Uh, this is the optical spectrum. Uh, you can see these strong AGN light indicators. Or there's no star formation in this either. It's all pure absorption line galaxy. This is the. Um, XMM, actually, sorry, this, this is the XMM plus the BAT. This is in photon space. This is in luminosity space. Almost all the luminosity comes above energies of 3 or 4 keV. So this is an example, and we have many, many, many of these for the observers in the audience. I can sort of step through them. Again, NG, I like the ones with NG, start with NGC. <laughs> we think we should have understood the whole NGC catalog by now, don't you think? <laughs> So this is NGC 973. This is the Sloan image. This is the optical spectrum. Uh, you have to be brave, I think, to call that an O3 line, rather than, you don't think so? <laughs> Obvious, OK. <laughs> Absorption features. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, in a catalog, you wouldn't have called it an AGN. 
Uh, and again, since there's no H, H beta, it's hard to put that on the Cooley diagram. Um, if you want the H beta, it also has the minimum absorption line in the stellar structure. Stellar, so it, well, that's, yeah. that's right. Okay. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. But remember, this is at a redshift of 0 0.001. So your slit subtends a tiny solid angle. So there has to be a very large ratio of stellar light to optical AGN light to do what you want it to do, which you can do it, of course. The physical explanation of what's happening is that the dust dust region is behind the dust layer. Yeah, the dust. Behind dust. Of extinction. Yeah, dust kills you. Yeah. Here, um, if you can see on the bottom, these are uh, Spitzer spectra where you would look for things like O4 and neon 5, and they're not there either. There's nothing in the optical spectrum either. There's a giant, this is a beautiful Sloan color. There's a nice giant ring of star formation. Uh, this is the IR and X-ray nucleus over there. So if you used, uh, if you were looking at this at a redshift of one, you would have uh, said this is where the AGN is, but you'd have been totally wrong. Uh, the AGN is hidden behind a huge amount of obscuration which you can see in the X-ray spectra. So we got lots and lots and lots of these examples. Round numbers, 30% of the bat sample have properties. This is one where Chandra misses it, just for entertainment value. <laughs> this is, uh, again, I stick to NGC objects for this. <laughs> 3079, which is a famous star-forming galaxy, by the way. Uh, this is the Chandra image in the soft X-ray band. These are all uh, giant H2 regions. But this is the Chandra contour in the hard band where the AGN is. So if you look at the Chandra data, um, there's this giant emission from star formation, and then this is the hard X-ray from BAT. And now that you know this is here, you can find the AGN. And again, I think even Mike would have trouble with emission lines in this <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> OK, so they exist. OK, so basically, this is what I've been saying. We're unbiased with respect to Compton thin obscuration, host galaxy properties, redshift, optical, UV, IR properties. We got a big sample. We want to figure out what we're getting. We're going to focus on the host galaxy properties. So just to remind you how you find AGN in the X-ray, you take an image. That's an X-ray image. There is the optical image. I think we can identify the AGN. Enough, enough detail there. This is. OK, this is what you can do with Chandra, but we all know that. This is a chunk. This is about a half square degree with Chandra with roughly 100,000 seconds per beam. Um, so there's 500 sources here. These two things are clusters at redshifts of a few tenths. Everything else is an AGN. This is the bad image, but it's the whole sky. So roughly equal numbers over the whole sky to a deep Chandra image on roughly a square degree. So we're talking about radically different redshifts, but similar sample sizes. It's just really hard to get optical follow-ups over the whole sky. And it's taken us a while, but we're, we're getting there. So this um, shows the, the 1,100 objects. There's all your famous X-ray sources on the galactic plane. And everything that's colored blue is an AGN. How many photons are actually not in any of the sources? Ah, the vast majority. It turns out that uh, the bat, I'm going to talk about that, is background dominated. Um, so the vast majority of the counts that the bat gets are cosmic rays. But uh, it's a um, non-imaging imager. It works by a mask technique, a shadow mask. Cosmic rays as in cosmic rays killing us. Yeah, yeah, right. So the diffuse emission, uh, the bat doesn't see the diffuse X-ray background unless one is very, very clever. Uh, one can do it, but it's not easy. Um, this is how it works. So, uh, ah, okay. So uh, a quick summary of the diff what for the audience who are not specialists: the diffuse X-ray background. Um, when you have moderate to low angular resolution, you look at a chunk of the sky, you see a very uniform glow. And we now believe that uniform glow is due to a very large number of AGN distributed over cosmic time. Um, it has a rather different spectrum from any individual source. And so you have to superimpose uh, very carefully objects that are unabsorbed, moderately obscured, and very obscured in just the right way as a function of redshift and luminosity to make this up but nature, nature does it. Um, what kind of energy does it actually put into something else like that? Radioactivity in the signal level? So, 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 so,
So the characteristic energy of the X-ray background in our frame is 40 keV. Okay. If you assume a, a model which has been tested by Chandra and XMM observations of evolution and luminosity functions, the uh, median redshift, it's a sloppy number, is roughly 1. And so the intrinsic uh, characteristic is about 80 keV. When you go much above uh, 40 keV in our frame, another component appears, which is, uh, has a very different shape, which most people believe is due to uh, beamed objects, blazars. And they dominate out to uh, very high energies. The um, high that, energy, what? Where does that, uh, that, that cut across the? Uh, based on work by Marco Yellow, it's a, roughly about 100 to 150 keV where the two cross each other. And um, so, no, it's a little bit. It's about 100 in our in our frame. So the bat just barely barely gets gets to that. Um, so it can be done, but it's it's it was a difficult job. Marco did a great job. So the way the bat works is that it's a mask. Before New Star, you couldn't really focus at high energies, and so basically it's a shadow mask. So you have convolved a very large source population with a, with a complex selection function of shadows on an, an imaging detector with 32,000 detectors. Uh, find yourself some really good software people, and you, you get a catalog. It's not easy, but it's been done. This is what the data actually look like. The SWIFT carries three telescopes, an X-ray telescope, a UV optical telescope, and the bat. This is, a, this is bat data. This is what the data actually look like. These are two AGN. This is what the raw data looks like. You can find the image quite clearly there. Uh, and this is what the, the galactic central uh, 40 degrees of our galaxy looks like in the bat. And this is what the very, very center looks like. So except for very, very, very close to the galactic center, there are no confusion issues. So sensitivity um, is roughly uniform across the whole sky. This is our exposure map. Most observers are not used to, these are contours in millions of seconds. So here we have 14 million seconds of exposure. Uh, here we only have 6 million seconds of exposure. <laughs> so you beat down the noise just by square root of n. There's lo lots and lots of time. And the sensitivity, uh, so this is the 50% uh, sense, this is the sky fraction, exposure time, the deepest exposures in the 70-month catalog are 15 million seconds. Uh, this tells you the sensitivity. 50% of the sky has sensitivity down to about 4 times 10 to the minus 12 in CGS units, and New Star is about 100 times uh, more sensitive. Actually, it does, New Star is not getting down to 5, 10 to the minus 14. It's getting down easily to 10, 1, 10 to the minus 13. So it's not quite 100 times better. But that's an exposure of only 100,000 seconds, as opposed to 10 million seconds. Uh, this is the sensitivity versus time. It's roughly going as the square root of time, which is really nice. These are all the different catalogs we released. This is the noise. This is the signal. The noise, this is uh, a log Gaussian. The noise is beautifully Gaussian. The thing is really behaving well. So um, trying to show you that we actually know what we're doing. OK, um, these are all the objects. I'm going to talk. This is now the distribution of the magnitude, absolute magnitudes in the J band. We use two masks because it covers the whole sky. And so. Average magnitude of these things? Well, here it is. This is uh, minus 24th in J is the median. But apparent. Oh, apparent. Um, apparent. Do I have that plot? No, I deleted that plot. Um, so the apparent is about. There it is, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Next, one, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah, apparent magnitude. So it's peaking at around 14th. This is, this is not J, this is B now. So they're very easy to observe with a moderate sized telescope. Okay, and that's what we did a lot of the observations using the two meter at Kitt Peak. And this is the redshift distribution. This is 0.05, 0.1, so it's strongly peaked. Uh, 0.08, 0.028 is the uh, median redshift. All of the objects out over here beyond redshifts of 0.2 are blazars. Virtually, uh, sorry, there's three or four non-blazars. 
So this is a low redshift survey. Okay, um, why couldn't we have used ROSAT to do this? ROSAT covers the whole sky, is sensitive. Here's the ROSAT rate versus the BAT rate. Notice the strong correlation of the data points. It's obscuration. This is one of those spectra. This is basically ROSAT. Ro whoops. ROSAT band, BAT band, big hole in the middle. Um, so you really can't use ROSAT at all. Well, that's not. ROSAT identifies about a third of the sample. So it's just like trying to you know, identify uh, obscured IR objects using UV data. I mean, it's just sort of silly. But everyone says an X-ray is an X-ray, but it's sort of silly. OK, so I was all our optical data. CO data, bat luminosity versus CO luminosity. Hmm, they're correlated. That's weird. Uh, IR spectra, just to show you we have the data. <laughs> And just to throw something that I'm not going to talk about, what you can do, you want to do blazars. This is the correlation between redshift and flux of our blazar sample. They're totally uncorrelated. You want to find blazars at redshifts greater than four. This is a really good way to start for the people who might want to do that. OK. So we all know this. Um, our AGN special, do they live in, I know it was just a teaser. Um, do AGN live in special places or special times or both? That's the, sort of the question. And I'm going to tell you that they live in special places, but I don't know if they live in special times. This is the famous um, De Mateo simulation and then Hernquist, sorry, um, Hopkins and Hernquist did this all over. This is the Hopkins and Hernquist simulation. This is the whole general scenario. Uh, I'm going to try to answer this. And the answer is they live in special galaxies. So the rest of the time is going to talk about the special galaxies. This is based mostly on my Koss's PhD thesis. And here's the summary in case you want to fall asleep now. Uh, the bat sample, the hosts are mostly spiral and irregular galaxies with roughly 30% involved in mergers or interactions. Only 2% of a similarly optically selected sample lie in mergers and interactions in the same redshift shell. We have a very low fraction of ellipticals, 3%. And of the 3%, half of those are sort of funny in one manner, way, shape, or another. Here's a pretty pictures of the interacting objects or two objects at the same redshift that are gravitationally bound. Um, it's very easy to identify these. Which you don't have to do anything subtle. You don't have to, um, well, as long as you have the images, you can find the mergers quite easily. And so when we have these statistics, they're, they're extremely robust. The colors of the hosts are midway between red and dead and active star forming. They're in the green valley. This is not a selection effect. So here is the big picture. Here is uh, roughly 160 galaxies taken from Mike Koss's thesis. This is the famous um, blue, red. These, are, these objects in the isopleths are chosen to have the same redshift selection function as the bad AGN. So it's not exactly what you saw from the SDSS. All right? So we're trying to compare like with like. There's, of course, a, a, a mass cutoff as well. Um, so we don't go down, include dwarfs, because I'll show you in a moment, we have very few dwarfs in the sample. So every single galaxy has been coded by its morphology. S is spiral, M is merger, I is irregular, and you would expect lots and lots of E's to be up here, but you'll have to look very carefully to find any of them. So there are massive red spirals. Your green get valley driven. Now there is a strong selection effect. The reddest systems are edge on, and the bluest systems are face on. So one has to be careful. But when one's comparing to the Sloan, one should just use this plot, because they haven't bothered to do that, select edge on versus face on. All right? So if you're just going to compare large samples with large samples, this plot. Notice these are the isopleths. There are all these bat hosts out here. Yeah? How does this diagram change if you do a dust correction, even a 0 to order 1, maybe okay. just on a EEJ diagram or something like that? Okay, so um, Mike has done that. 
the vector, uh, so you know, uh, reddening would, well, it depends which way you want to go. I mean, this way, it's the same vector, but it's, it's along that way, just where you point the arrow, it depends. Whether you take something that's blue and make it red, or take something red and de-redden de it and make it blue. The x-axis is g minus r color. It's g minus r mass, stellar mass. Right, but that's extinction corrected already, right? Uh, yes, it's extinction corrected. So you can only move in color space, but not in mass space. And the correction, mass correction is fairly small. It's 2 tenths of a dex. So you can move in color, but not, not mass space. So you cannot move. I'm sorry, I was incorrect. You can't move like that. <laughs> yeah? Let me rephrase the question in a slightly uh, more modern way. Um, if you did an extinction correction in the proper star formation rate uh, determination that as agent free as possible, are the host galaxies main sequence star formers in the blue cloud that are dust reddened because of the merger, <coughs> or are they objects that are actually systematically different from the normal star forming galaxy population? I can't answer your question exactly that way, but I can answer it slightly differently. Now that we're looking at the IR data, we're finding a lot more star formation from our neon 2 or far IR luminosity than we would from any de-reddened optical spectrum. So um, Lisa Winter published this two years ago where she basically found very little indications of reddening in the optical spectra. And I think what's happening is just blocked. There's not there's so much reddening that a lot of the star formation just doesn't affect the optical spectra. Um, I could refer to, refer to her paper, which I have later on. But this is, so these objects here are extraordinarily rare in the Sloan. You can just see it. This is the 99th percent isoplex. So these are roughly a quarter or a third of all the bad objects. These are special galaxies. I'll show you some images of them later. So this is the statement. Hosts of AGN do not live in a population drawn from your normal optically selected imaging catalogs. So they are special. Here are uh, pictures of the uh, most luminous ones. All of the most luminous ones are in mergers or in massive spirals. So if you had a luminosity selected, not a flux limited sample, you'd be even more special. I'm sorry to drag that. Sure, sure. No, it's okay. It's a complex plot. That was the colored contours are just Sloan galaxies. Chosen in the same redshift shell, shell with the same selection criteria. Correct. But this suggests if you didn't look at the galaxies that Sloan considered oh. active. Okay, that's about five slides from now. All right. <laughs> uh, so here's your pretty pictures of the most luminous objects to show you that they are. So what about? Yeah. Well, or yeah, mergers or, or giant spirals. So here is the um, absolute magnitudes for that sample. So taking this plot and compressing it along the um, magnitude, not mass range. And the Sloan is the purple, color choice is not great, I'm sorry. Um, the vertical bars are the Sloan sample and the histograms are the bat sample. And you can see the shift in that. It's about 1.3 mags shift. So blue to red is interesting to talk about, but there's also mass. Low, low mass to high mass. Right. So the bat sample is a flux limited sample, so right. there's a massive bias to more luminous objects. So if you could somehow do the bat survey at 100 times the depth. And <laughs> well, that's what New Star wants to do. And therefore be complete okay. down to some Eddington limit, would that mass okay. bias you see, would that disappear? Okay. I don't know, but what we have done that experiment in our own data set, because over the last five years, our sensitivity has increased by a factor of four. And what we find is that as we've gone fainter, uh, we find because luminosity function at low luminosities is very flat, we tend to find more luminous higher mass objects. So. In our own sample, increasing our sensitivity by a factor of a few has amplified the results, not, not lessened them. I can't go 100 times. But when I go 100 times, I'm now finding objects that are 
so low luminosity that I have difficulty, from an x-ray point of view, ensuring myself that they're AGN. So I have I sort of hit a stop. I can't, I can't answer your question. <laughs> so this is the um, now removing all the morphological information. So now you can see where things are in color, mass space. And you can just literally see where the green valley is. And so these occupy the green valley where basically optically selected Sloan galaxies tend to avoid. So luminosity, mass, color. They're all different. Here's where those massive spirals are. So here's now mass versus color. And as is well known when in the Sloan sample, so this is now inactive galaxies from the Sloan. And here's, your, here's the answer to your question. Here is the Sloan selected AGN. So the Sloan selected AGN and the Sloan selected normal galaxies have the same trend of color versus mass, but the bat do not. They have roughly the same color as a function of mass. And you can project that in a mass color plot, and that's where the bat tend to lie, not where your normal objects are. I'm not going to show you the 90 micron data, but they tend to have high 90 micron of stellar mass. Here, so I'll skip over that one. So, this one? Wait, which one? I think back two slides now. Come on. It's refusing to go back. Oh. Right. Everywhere where, on, on the lower left, I just see everywhere where there is a sign difference between the inactive and active galaxies mm -hmm. as well. The sign difference is in the same direction yeah. as the Right. So uh, another way of looking at that is this plot, where these are not, the normalization here is, is just percentage of the sample. It's not a real mass function. It's just a self-normalized mass function, because there's vastly different numbers of objects. So in the blue, you have the um, mass function from the Sloan selected sample. That's in blue. In red stars, you have the Sloan AGN selected. And so you can see exactly what you said. The Sloan AGN selection is more massive on average than the field galaxies, and the bat is more so. Yeah, this, yes, yeah. You know, Kaufman and Heckman published uh, about seven years ago that um, they were also finding significant differences twixt the um, AGN selection and the normal galaxies. Yes? I have to really object to that result. Most of that is driven by liners, which are not AGN. All the high mass things are extended uh, emission. OK. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, I think it was Wong that first pointed that out. So Mark Sarzi showed it really nicely with the yeah. IQ data from Saron, where he actually repeated the experiment of what they would look like in a Sloan fiber. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, many of them look like weak liners in Sloan. And you can show that the actual extended emission is seen by the IFU is actually inconsistent with 1 over r squared dimming. So I did correctly report what they said in their paper, Kaufman and Heckman. <laughs> I just object to that paper. Oh, I, okay. I, I'm not going to referee it in front of the rest of us. But I don't see any problem with our particular selection. So what do these uh, <laughs> giant galaxies look like? Here they are. Pictures are nice. Um, how often do you see a spiral with a rotation speed of 270 kilometers a second? <laughs> Hardly ever. <laughs> and an absolute magnitude of minus 22 in B. These are very rare objects indeed, yet undisturbed. Here's, these are the, here's another one. And they're enormous. This is 40 kiloparsec, 65 kiloparsec diameter. I don't remember off the top of my head to go look it up. I, I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't. The answer is I don't know. In fact, I think maybe it's not known because I think the nucleus is pretty darn obscured, so it may be difficult to know. Uh, and here's another one. This is a Hubble image, and this is the Digital Sky Survey image. This is actually a very famous object. This has a black hole mass. I think it's 8.2 or 8.3. Um, this one only has a 296 kilometer a second rotation speed. <laughs> this is taken from, from LIDA. 
delete a database. I've never seen velocities like that. So there's the mass selection. So what about um, things that I'm not going to talk about in detail, but maybe I can talk about the someone later. Um, one of the big discoveries that Mike and Lisa made was the fact that a very large fraction of the bat hosts live in mergers. So this is now the separation projected on the plane of the sky. Um, in green is a, a control sample uh, taken two different ways. And this is the uh, bat sample. And this is the fraction that have a uh, physical companion at less than 20 kiloparsecs. Roughly 20% of the bat have a companion. Roughly 2% of the Sloan, both the AGN and um, non. This is even going out to distances. We see a significant effects out to 250 kiloparsecs. So this is not statistics. The bat selected AGN have a very much higher merger rate than um, field, field galaxies. We've been following this up with Chandra observations, and we got a lot of uh, dual AGN. We have about a factor of 30 times higher rate than optically selected surveys. But the other AGN is frequently very low luminosity. Very few of the bats are in ellipticals, about a third of the field rate. So here's the percentage of the sample. This is bat AGN, inactive galaxies, Sloan, and uh, modulo what Kevin said when has to figure out. Um, this is taken from the Munich catalog, so there's maybe some biases there. So elliptical, intermediate classification, spiral, and merging. You can. Intermediate means they're very hard to classify, so they're sort of distorted. They're not classical spirals. They're clearly not ellipticals. They're you know, just uh, funny looking. <laughs> Most people just use elliptical as meaning non-star forming. Revival. Well, no. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to use elliptical in the sense of you know your classical E whatever. I, 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 I'm not Gerard de Varc Galours. I can't do a good job on this. This was pulled mostly from you know, Ned or whatever. Uh, if I try to classify them, I just get it wrong. Um, so there are luminosity effects, um, as this is now the famous Devoculurus T-type, where your classical ellipticals are down here, S0s are here, and these are all spirals. So this is now the hard X-ray luminosity. And you can see that, that basically at low luminosity, well, sorry, all the ellipticals, statistically speaking, there's a higher probability for an elliptical to have a lower X-ray luminosity. I think it's the right way of phrasing this. But it's not a strong correlation. Uh, but as you go up in luminosity and make a histogram, uh, you can see that the morphology is changing. All the luminous sources uh, tend to be um, these spirals or massive spirals. Um, this is now the absolute magnitude of the host. There is no difference between type 1s and type 2s. They live in the same types of galaxies in terms of at least their absolute magnitude. And uh, is this true? Is the host changing with redshift? If you go to the literature, the answer is yes. If you look up all your Cosmos papers or whatever, uh, you find out that at higher, higher redshifts, more and more, the X-ray selected uh, AGN tend to live in, in early type systems. So this is now color coded by peculiars and different colors. But rather than absorbing all the information here, if you go by the literature, um, as you go to higher redshifts, the systems tend to be uh, luminous red using the non um, with PIC3 data. And what Kevin will tell you is that's biased. Because if you look in the uh, with pic 3 data, a lot of these luminous red galaxies have disks. So a lot of those are thick indices. Oh, okay. So a lot of what we took out here is probably not a good comparison. Uh, there is a strong relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the X-ray luminosity. Uh, this is what a linear relationship would indicate. So it's sublinear, but they're correlated. So round numbers, no analysis, the Eddington ratio. Aren't you saying most of the stars are in the disk and not the bulge? Yeah. So yeah. what kind of bulge-bulge relation can you use? 
You're not I'm not using a bulge black hole relation. I'm using an integrated mass of the galaxy versus black hole relation. Okay, like if I was reading your slide rather than listening. Oh, right. But if you use the bulge black hole, then you would get it. Yeah. But this is not that. So this is something new. We haven't published this yet. This is one of Ke uh, Mike's six on <laughs> papers in preparation. So um, here is why I believe that um, mergers are not seen in the Hubble cosmos fields. Um, there is publicly available software which Mike Koss has used, which you can take an image and you could redshift it for a given exposure depth with Hubble. Now we've all learned uh, that um, cosmological expansion has a surface brightness diminution for a non-Lambda universe that's 1 plus z to the fourth. For a Lambda universe, it's something slightly different, but it's still 1 plus z to something like 3, I believe, for a Lambda universe. That is an enormous effect. It's three magnitudes of dimming in a redshift of one. This is what happens when you take objects like the ones we observe and redshift them. So um, let's take, unfortunately, this merger is at the bottom. But basically, the whole thing disappears at a redshift of a half. You have no indication of it being a merger whatsoever. Subtle features like you know, tidal arms totally disappear. I believe it's fair to say that a large fraction of the papers that have done this work have not included that effect in their analysis. We pointed this out to the authors, and they say, well, but we see mergers. And I'm saying, yes, these are giant train wrecks that you're seeing. You're not seeing the effects which are typical mergers. So I don't believe any, I'm not saying they're wrong, I just don't think they've done an analysis which allows me to know that they're right. No, this is subtle, subtle statement. <laughs> So this is why I believe it may be that mergers are important at higher redshifts, but the data exist, but we just don't know. So I don't know where on this plot things are going. I don't know which way the vectors are. Um, I haven't found a way of actually taking this vast difference between the galaxies. I mean, let's do something simple, mass, all right? Um, in this plot, which is stellar mass, you know, mergers can grow you um, that way. Shutting off star formation can't change the mass. They can only move you that way. So I don't yet know which, if any, of this um, wisdom is, is true. So this is just the entertainment value. Um, if you're looking for AGN, um, how should you find them if you're not an X-ray astronomer? Right. So this is looking for AGN signatures in the optical images using U, G, R, I, and Z data. These are all low redshift. You can perform GALAX fitting. You can look for the nucleus. Well, you miss half of them because they're type twos, but you know that. So optical indicators miss, this pure stellar indicators miss about a half. This is using soft X-rays and you um, miss a fair bit because they're highly obscured. You don't see them in, even in the two to 10 keV band. The worst way of finding AGN is to look for O3. <laughs> There's very poor correlation between the bat luminosity and the O3. And everything else is, this is using um, O4, this is 12 microns, infrared, but the worst is using O3. So beware people who like to use the best data from large databases because it's the best data. Yeah? What's the explanation for why it's so bad? So what we found is that um, as again, Tim Heckman has published, for type 1s, for secret 1s, the variance between hard x-rays and O3 is not large. It's maybe 100%, which is actually pretty good. All right. However, for type 2s, it's all over the place. It's four orders of magnitude variance. And so you have tremendous biases um, in using O3. And I think it's just dust. And we've shown this by comparing the O4 to the O3, where you should... I know there's an ionization difference and there's a slight density difference, but to zeroth order, you're measuring the same thing. And O4 finds a lot more objects than O3 does, but even more so, the luminosity you see in the two is only weakly correlated. It, it's, it's dust. So that's Eddington ratios and all that, but I've, I've hit my hour now. So the point I'd like to convey is that a new selection technique using hard X-rays, which is 
almost unbiased with respect to the host galaxy. Very few host galaxies are Compton thick. Um, finds a different result than something we've learned about for 50 years. It has strong effects on what we think should be triggering AGN and why this galaxy hosts an AGN rather than that. The only thing I'm going to tell you is that mass has something to do with it. But there's a lot of other stuff going on that I don't fully understand. So we've been trying to follow this up now by getting other star formation rate indicators. So we have all this Herschel data. We're chewing through it right now. Uh, we're aiming for a draft, hopefully, by the end of this workshop. <laughs> but even then, we found out with the Herschel data that the angular resolution was not adequate. And so we've gotten a lot of EVLA data, which we've just gotten. So I don't even, I, I, I can't even summarize it yet. But we will basically know how much star formation there is and where the star formation is. If you believe in feedback, Either way, does star formation trigger the AGN? Does the AGN shut off star formation? Naively, you'd expect if the AGN shuts off star formation, you'd have a hole in star formation in the center of one of these galaxies. These are not low, these are moderate luminosity AGN. This is where the bulk of AGN luminosity comes out, integrated over the life of the universe. So if you're going to use all this AGN energy to affect star formation, um, you have a choice of utilizing this, which is where most of it comes out, or not, and only focusing on you know, quasar hosts or whatever. But at least in the low redshift, we'll tell you the answer, or we're in the process of telling you the answer. So. Sure. No, very few of these are in galaxy clusters. Um, but they are clustered in the sense that we have a much higher um, binary slash merger rate. So they live in local, they tend to live in locally overdense regions, about a third of them. So That's right. Do you find X-ray sources in dwarf galaxies and or do you find the MBHs? We find a few in dwarfs. Um, I was actually working on, on that. Find the view there. Oh, it's here somewhere. Anyhow, the answer is we find a few dwarfs, not not very many. Uh, these are light curves. I got lots. Of, now I just got to find it rather than going through all the view graphs. One thing I would like to point out, which I didn't get a chance to, but it's AGN physics, um, not coast galaxies. This is the um, whoops. So this is the o, why O3 is bad. Um, so this is for uh, from Lisa Winter's thesis. This is the luminosity in O3 versus the bat luminosity, where a, a horizontal line would be equal ratios. And this is total luminosity. The blue are the type twos, and the red are the type ones. This is one order of magnitude. So if you have include the type twos, you have tremendous scatter. Um, this um, is another result that Mike got. This is now the nuclear luminosity in the I band using GalFit to pull out the nuclear luminosity. So type twos aren't here. And this is the hard X-ray luminosity. This is a linear relationship. So if you do the right thing, this was the last time this was done was back in the 80s. <laughs> People didn't look at low redshift samples since then, it seems. It's sort of weird. So there's a strong relationship. Here, meaning the AGN? Yeah, nuclear optical light versus the AGN. This is dominated by AGN light. Uh, here's the X-ray background, luminosity functions. This is the big theory. <laughs> Well, post question, but I'm. That's the best I'm type. Confused, <laughs> very, very confused now. When you, uh, about your last point about feedback, yeah. what you might expect to see. Uh, so, my understanding of feedback and my confusion also goes back to say the feedback, the feedback you're talking about, which is shutting off star formation yeah. and making galaxies look, look red as opposed to goes back to say there, there are a few seminal papers. One of them is the Coton 2006, right. where they combine all these 
catalog from a factory dark matter simulation mm -hmm. of the recipe for the stars, and they need some sort of energy That's right. to shut off the star right. formation of the recipe. Right. But if I understand well, they only, in order to make everything work and must function with color and all that, they only implement the, this radio mode feedback uh, in the big, they, massive, elliptical, dead right. area. Okay, so that's the, the center of clusters. So yeah, that I don't understand because they need to not only shut it off, they need to keep it off. It, it, right, it's a low mode. Maintenance mode. Yeah. So what do we expect to see that? So then this okay, these objects would not be. No correlation yeah. with yeah. the kind of objects you're looking at. Right. The quote unquote radio mode, if it has any reality, would probably correspond to what we see in galaxy clusters with bubbles right. and objects the and everything. Is effective. Now when you look when you look at the Croton paper, they actually uh, it's fascinating. They actually say right. explicitly it's there's no quasar feedback. Yeah. It is we assume that it's implicit in the starburst that the starburst uses up the gas and therefore the galaxy shuts off its star formation. But but what we know is that galaxies are baryonic poor. If you compare the fraction of baryons to dark matter in a galaxy to the uh, W map or Planck values, galaxies are have about one fifth or one tenth the number of baryons they should. So something has in all galaxies the Milky Way, which is not a giant elliptical, and has been forming stars ever since redshift of one. Or, or okay, so it's a different. Remember, giant ellipticals. All the stars are old. Stars formed at redshifts greater than one. Milky Way stars have been forming continuously over a very long time. And yet both of them have baryonic deficits on the order of a factor of five or 10. So I think Croton really slid an awful lot of stuff that they should have been saying. So um, in my personal opinion, you need to have something that stops the accumulation of gas in Milky Way spirals, or at least gas that we can see, and that stops the formation of stars from that gas. They may be the same phenomena, but they may not, not be. We're looking for a much more, a much more broadly defined. Yeah, and it's the, same, it's the same problem in the sense that, I mean, there's a paper today on Astro PH which pointed out that this type of AGN um, cannot do any feedback because basically the um, energy can't get out into the host. You know, there's all this um, cold gas that prevents photons from the AGN hitting anything that's further away than a few hundred parsecs. So in their calculation, AGN don't do anything in spirals. What they don't say is how you prevent the spirals from accumulating all those baryons. And I, maybe I haven't read these theoretical papers carefully enough. But you're not finding AGN in typical That's right. And precisely because you're looking at very nearby galaxies, you can ask, are these particular AGN doing anything noticeable to their hosts? Well, the answer, I can't answer that question, but I can say the hosts know that they have an AGN. Or the AGN knows it's in a particular galaxy. Well, that's the identification with the massive spirals and the mergers and so on. Yeah. But that's not at all the same thing as this AGN is either expelling gas or limiting star formation in its host. And you would expect that somehow or other, um, you ought to be able to see a signature of that. If, there, if right. it were expelling gas, you ought to be able to see outward moving gas. So the answer is, that turns out to be uh, difficult, but people are doing that now. One of the major shocks of the last two years is that one of the most direct evidences for outflowing winds is in the far IR with molecular signatures. There are molecular winds that have been found which are very massive, carrying a lot of momentum. I don't think anybody predicted that. Um, optical indicators of winds are very subtle, um, but we have a strong indirect indicator. So again, we haven't written the paper, but what we're finding from our Herschel data is that we have very high specific star formation rates, very high star formation rates per square kiloparsec in the nucleus. So clearly, these guys are not shutting off star formation now. That's right. In, in, yeah. Well, at least in the nuclear. Exactly. In fact, it's the reverse almost. Yeah. A fraction of what you. So, 
I mean, the fraction of galaxies that are AGN depends really, really, really strongly on what you mean by an AGN. Um, so our AGN are about 5 to 10% of all galaxies. But, well, you have to be careful. Are you, an how you, are you counting galaxies or are we of massive galaxies? They're a very low fraction of dwarfs. So, of course, the numbers are dominated by dwarfs. So you've got to put a mass cut in. So if you say a mass cut at you know, 10 to the 9.5 or 10 to the 10, then it's 5 or 10% of all galaxies. But again, all the, most of the massive, very massive galaxies on average are giant ellipticals, and we see very few of those. So it's a subtle, you have, the answer you get depends on the way you phrase the question. <laughs> You can get up to 80% or nearly 100% if you restrict yourself to the very nearby you. It depends on your ability to detect accretion yeah. power the mission comes from mass level. Yeah. If you limit yourself to 20 megaparsecs and push it to yet into a limit for a, a hundred solar mass black hole, virtually all of them. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I think a lot of. Yeah. No, I'm talking about massive. So if there is a limit below which you cannot tell anymore whether you're dealing with high mass x divine or isolated collection of mass. It depends on how much mass your x-ray needs to be Okay. So here's the um eighty percent for much lower Yeah. So so I think so let me ask the restricted question. If I pick a mass cut at ten to the ten roughly I pick a luminosity of 10 to the 42 and above, and I throw away all the ellipticals, I'm probably at about 5% of the spirals are today AGN. But to zeroth order, the evolution is 1 plus, at redshifts less than 1, is 1 plus z to the fourth. All right? Now, you know, 2 to the fourth, we can all do that. <laughs> That's 16. I multiply 16 by 5%, it's, you know, almost every galaxy. So we're, we're now living in the end of the AGN universe, but redshifts of one, things were much, much more active. If these objects are the same objects as the redshift of one, then it's a universal phenomena. And we are indeed, by looking at the low redshift universe, sampling what's happening at redshifts of one. I'm not going to redshifts of two or three, because things are clearly different there. It's going to require a new star to sample the redshift half universe to answer these questions. Are the hosts of those objects the same as the hosts of what we see in our sample? And we're going to have to wait a few years for them to build up a large enough sample. At the rate they're going, it's going to take them about 10 years to get a similar size. But they'll have results in two or three years that are, it's a large enough sample to say. So the assumption I'm making is that between now and redshift of one, things have not radically changed and that the objects are the same. And that by looking in the low redshift universe where we can see things very clearly, we're learning about the peak of AGN activity, which is at roughly redshift of one. That's a fundamental assumption. And I can't check it right now. Pardon my ignorance. Uh, what will E-Rosita do for this field? Uh, E-Rosita won't do very much for this field. Um, hold on here uh, before I finish that sentence. Um, Iwazita will sort of do Chandra-type work, but with vastly better statistics. Sort of the 2 to 10 kev rest frame. But they do all sky, right? They do all sky, so they get vastly better statistics. So Chandra has only a few thousand AGN. Uh, Iwazita will have hundreds of thousands, probably millions. So the statistics, you'll be able to slice and dice things in incredibly fine ways that we can't do right now. But it doesn't go high enough in energy that its bias of obscuration has to be taken into account, and you just can't do that without the sample. So it will basically make the statistics incredibly better, and you'll be able to answer questions about de over densities. You'll be able to look at very, very subtle effects. You'll be able to take my gross morphological three classes and slice them however, however you will. So it's going to be the Sloan of X-ray astronomy, uh, but like the Sloan, it will have problems as well, but Nothing is perfect. It's it's very very good is the answer, but it's not perfect. Yeah. 
of the lifespan of mergers and your ability to see them and so on. Could you it's about a factor statement that 100% of APNs were in mergers? It's about 60%. Okay. Because we have these giant spirals, which if someone help me out here, uh, show no morphological character. They're the grand design spirals. So they've not been involved in a major merger in a very long time. And they're about a third of the sample. So, okay. so two thirds. Right. So there has to be at least two modes. Right. Yeah. So major merger is the answer. So what we find for the duals is they're all in major mergers. None of the mer none of the duals are in minor mergers. So if you want two AGN, <laughs> then you better have a major merger. And it has to be a major merger between two gas-rich galaxies. But that's another talk. Well, I think I think it's partially. So we have. I think this is a, a sociological problem. You know, what is? You have to define what you mean by an AGN before you go on and make all these subsidiary statements. And as Kevin's pointed out, in the original uh, Sloan samples, they were uh, very generous in defining an AGN, and they included many objects that I would not have included in my sample. They're too low at luminosity intrinsically. There are other physical phenomena that can mimic an AGN in that 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 range. Yeah, that's, that's my definition. Then I'm 100% certain what I have. Okay, so what we could do is uh, a fair chunk of these have Hubble data, and you can look at way down into the center and see what's going on. Um, I've not done that, but statistically, Matt Malkin has. And he finds out that roughly 40 or 50 percent of all um, Seifert's ones with Hubble data have sp these uh, dust spirals in the center, these sort of flocculent uh, dust structures. There's indications of um, something dynamical that's going on, but they're very subtle. Yes. So that clearly uh, statistically significant. A greater fraction than in non AGN? I'd have to go reread his paper. It was written in 1998, so uh, I don't remember. the. I think the answer is yes, but I'm, I, I know for ellipticals the answer is yes. So if you look at elliptical galaxies uh, that are AGN hosts versus non AGN, the incidence of dust structures is much higher. But for spirals, I just don't know. So, but I think um, when we do this field and we talk about, eight, I mean, we're all talking about black holes, but if we're looking at the AGN phenomena, we really have to have a uh, more fully formed statement. Because if you include very low luminosity objects, something else is going on. And there's all sorts of subtle things that could be occurring. Once you're above some threshold, I pick 10 to the 42 for both observational reasons and also for that's the knee and the luminosity function roughly. Yes, what you see in my sample, and I showed you, so there are luminosity indicators. As you go to higher and higher luminosities, things even get more biased. Um, and that's probably because you, you're getting more and more massive black holes or maybe more and more gas to feed them or whatever. But um, it's, um, I think at the other extreme, at the very low luminosity end, there's just so many phenomena that are going on that it's very difficult to un untangle things. And when you do these automatic processes of very large databases, it's very difficult to insert biases in there that you don't realize what you've done. And I think, unfortunately, our field has gone in that direction. These very large surveys with 50 author papers and nothing gets checked. Well, no. I see galaxies that have a lot of gas. I don't know if it's flowing to the center. No. Yeah, the <laughs> uh, cool. I, got, I got mergers. Oh, I agree. This is, this is the accurate 
Yeah. Do the interpretation also. Okay. So, very, so, very likely we know from the simulation. Right. Okay. But, but let me just say, so, so the controversy that's arisen in the last five years has been from these deep surveys, Cosmos, Chandra Deep Field South, et cetera, et cetera, where there have been many papers now published that say we find um, that the host galaxies of AGN are not in mergers compared to the field sample. They make that as a very strong statement, and therefore they say specifically that that merger scenario is ruled out by their data. All right? What I'm seeing is the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So what I'd like them to do is either understand the differences between what they've done and what we've done. Luminosity dependent, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, we're in the same luminosity range. The Chandra surveys at Redshifts 1 pick out 10 to the 43, 10 to the 44 ergs per second in the X-ray. That's where the numbers are. But the reason, those surveys give you a reason, com very comparable merger fractions, 30 percentage. Nobody but they say the field is 30 percent also at those redshifts. So that's a, that's a different question. That's then uh, figuring out whether the AGN host galaxies are special. Yeah. What the surveys at higher redshifts say is that most of the host galaxies do not appear to be in major mergers, more specifically galaxies with high cystic indices or two nuclei. But if you go to higher luminosities, the, the, the merger oh. fraction actually increases. Go to the most luminous. That's right. In They're the, almost all. All of them are train wrecks. That's right. Well, essentially yeah. all of them. But they've gone out of their way in most of their especially the Cosmos people, yes. to say that mergers are not a trigger of AGN. It's, it's purely the volume you're looking at and, and your flux limit that dictates what sources you pick up. And if you look at the low luminosity and fewer mergers, if you look at the high luminosity and more mergers. Yeah, so I'm not saying anything about causality here. It's just that seems to be the observational result. I mean, it's, I don't think it's a, because you know, you're getting 30%-ish, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that technically still gives you a majority. Well, but, but it's what was said here, the lifetime for how long can we see a merger using our sure. gross criteria? Sure. It's roughly a few hundred million years. Yeah. And so objects that have had a merger 500 million years ago, we wouldn't have called one now. We're right. missing so those objects. Lines, but, I mean, there's room to argue that many, if not most, of the AGM we see in the whole universe are not caused by mergers, are not caused by major mergers. But, I mean, that's a very different statement than, you know, like a, a candle's result saying that, you know, 4% of AGM and mergers are caused by mergers, right? So, I mean, I think that's the, the crucial well, difference. Well, uh, so I can't speak for the candle's team, but we did this with a smaller field long before they did. Um, and our statistics were small, uh, but uh, you know, we tried to build on them. And we always, the, the only thing we ever said is that the majority of these sources do not appear to be in high cersic uh, index objects, as in they don't have prominent bulges, or appear to have the, the key signature of having like two nuclei or something like that. And we, we always are careful about propagating those uncertainties into the states we made. We certainly never said there are no merger mergers. We said major mergers are not the main driver of this activity. And I think that that's an important um, so it could also be that the universe has changed since the redshift to one. Well, so this is the funny thing. As far as we can tell, like so if you look at the plot on in the tristratal letter, where we try we, we basically just put everyone's data on the same plot of volumetric luminosity versus host galaxy merger fraction, to zero thought, and of course there are huge selection effects that go into this, but to zero thought it doesn't appear to evolve redshift, at least out to like one, one and a half. Which is weird. So how about I convince you that AGN live in special places. I can't convince you yet they live at special times. <laughs> and the effect on feedback is to be determined. 